Hello and welcome to Basement Fodder, the only show whose host stuck a potato in the tailpipe of the Batmobile and did not receive a severe beating. I'm Todd. I'm Dave. <laughs> Batman did not catch me. <laughs> fast, greasy, fast lightning. <laughs> not really, though. I'm really slow. He did it. <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> because I can't run. <laughs> if we were in the water, I could be quick, but I can't be quick. I like I'm the land. Batmobile, I'm like though. Aquaman. I wouldn't put a potato, though, in there. I like the Batmobile. I would put it in the potato of the shitty Batmobile. <laughs> Which one is the shitty one to you, though? Uh, to me, the Tumblr, because it's not a Batmobile. Like, it's cool as a thing, yeah. not as a Batmobile. And plus, it's in the uh, Nolanverse. I don't give a shit about anything in that. I don't button. know. To me, that's still not the shittiest Batman one. I think the George Clooney Batmobile is still way shittier. Eh, that was pretty lame, too. Was fucking weird. But I don't have the... Ha- I don't know. I, like, that one didn't jump out at me, I guess, because it wasn't all that much different from the other ones. Like, the Tumblr shitty. just does not remotely feel like a, a superhero's vehicle to me. It just feels like a military assault vehicle. Yeah, but the new one is very more, like, you know, kind of... I think of, it looks more batmobile than the Tumblr did. I mean, yeah, but it still has heavy, heavy influences from it does, the Tumblr. It does, but it still has a heavy influence from being a Batmobile, too, which I, and I like that. Yeah. But regardless... <laughs> It's been a long week, as it always fucking has been. <laughs> for you, not for me. Like for me, the week just goes by quick as shit. Well, you have a, a hard physical job that kind of yeah. does that, doesn't it? <laughs> Sleep, lots of work, goes sweat by balls really, off, yeah, goes, goes by really quick. So for me, the week's just like days fly by. <laughs> Dave, Dave works for a shipping company. Um, let's, let's, let's say their name. Uh, um, uh, FPS. <laughs> UPS. I work for UPS. UPS does not condone our speaking about them on the show, I'm sure. But... Dave doesn't give a fuck about whether UPS gives a fuck about Call that. Call him FDS. <laughs> I'm an unloader. I fucking throw boxes for hours on end. Sweat balls off. Yeah. Create ball soup. <laughs> yeah. Sauna. That is my taint. Sauna. You know, you know. It, which uh, promoted you to change your uh, new, to get your new hairstyle, which makes you look oddly like Zangief <laughs> from Street Fighter. <laughs> yes, I shaved my head and I have a mohawk and my... And your beard being beard as beard and stuff yeah, like that. So very Zangief I've gotten right now. two like you look either like Zangief or I look like Ragnar from fucking Vikings and stuff like that. Which, which I did say would be your fan casting. Yeah. Which either way, I'm okay with these answers because you know I like Zangief from Wreck It Ralph. <laughs> He's not the bad guy. Yeah, just bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, the week started off. Uh, well, at least the end of the, the end of the last weekend started off fun for you because you went to go see UFC with some friends at the chicken place, which I never get to go to because it's nowhere around here. <laughs> yeah, and I went back down. To Frickers. Date. Yeah, I went back down to Dayton, like to go to Frickers and see UFC 200 with some friends of mine and drink a bunch of beer and eat chicken and stuff. So, what did you think of the show? It, it being fucking a huge show. sucked. <laughs> it <laughs> fucking sucked dick. Well then. <laughs> that was one of the worst UFCs I have ever fucking seen in my life. Dude. Really? Yeah. Now, did you watch like, all the preliminary yes, card and everything? Yes, okay. Yeah. Actually, one of the best fights was on one of the prelims. Like, um, where is it? Uh, yeah, that one right there, the lightweight one. Sage Northcutt. Uh, and Enrique Merin and stuff. I uh, <laughs> didn't watch these ones. The 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 uh, fight pass prelim card. Yeah, yeah, like I think we saw like the last one. Oh, the Diego Sanchez. Like we were gonna watch that. We caught the other, but it was like it's Diego, and I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't see any of those. Uh, but we watched that one. The Sage North Cut is probably to me, other than the women's fight, were like the best fights. Um, okay. The T.J. Dillonshaw and... I like T.J. Dillonshaw as a fighter. That one was good. That was okay, uh, but it wasn't, you know, anything too... He beat you know, Rafael As- Asanko? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he did it, Yeah, and he did a really good job. I'll give him that way. Uh, the catchweight one, uh, Kevin... 
That one yeah. was Johnny Hendrix versus Kevin Gaston. Dude, fuck Johnny Hendrix. That guy <laughs> sucks dick. He spent the entire match being a bitch. Like, no. What about uh, Kat Zangano and Juliana Pena? Because I like Kat Zangano. I've seen her fight quite a few times, and she's pretty damn good. But she did get beat. She did get beat. Uh, that one was good. Like the women's matches were probably some of the best ones and stuff. All right, that was that was a good. I'm one. sure nobody really gives a shit about prelims. Let's talk about the main card since it was the one that actually had some you know yeah. actual names on it. So uh, the Women's bantam weight. Well, well that no, was the main. No, no, well, let's start at the. So, yeah, let's start. Kane at the Velasquez, Kane Velasquez versus Tra- Travis, Travis Brown. Brown. Okay, so uh, Travis Brown looks like a big Viking motherfucker. Has some like cool tattoos and stuff against Kane Velasquez. Uh, this match was okay. It was a technical knockout. Uh, one of the you know only ones, pretty much. Yeah, four minutes fifty seven uh, seconds into round one. Yeah, it was. Kane imposing his will. He's a bigger guy. Yeah. Flabby too, kinda. And like yeah, lately, yeah. Yeah, but he just out you know, outdid Travis. Travis, I think, at first had a game plan and then Kane had a better one and Kane came out and kinda fucking whooped his ass. And like it's sad. I, I wanted Travis to win because I fucking can't stand Cain Velasquez. He's a fucking douchebag. I don't um, think anybody likes Cain Velasquez. Yeah, nobody really gives a fuck about him. <laughs> uh, but you know what? He did. He imposed his will. He did some really good striking, some good takedown and stuff. So he deserved the win. I give that to him. Like that was you know a good one. It's interesting positioning going from a heavyweight fight to a featherweight fight with uh, Jose Aldo and Frankie Edgar. Oh fuck that fight, dude. That Fuck bad. that fight. Oh. Okay, so here's my thing. This fight right here to me is a big fuck you to the judges. Like, to me, I hate this fight because it showcases how bad the judging in, like, UFC MMA stuff is. Yeah. Because Jose Aldo, all he did was fucking dance around, avoid, try to avoid getting hit, take some shots, maybe threw some defensive shots and stuff like that, but the whole time, Frankie Edgar pressed him. Fucking just, even taking blast after blast to the face, and being bloody and shit like that, he fucking kept going after Jose Aldo. And, mm-hmm. like, Aldo fucking was not checking any of his kicks, was just taking the shots, being fucking cocky Anderson Silva style, like, yeah. I don't need to block your shit, I can just take it. And unfortunately for Frankie, it wasn't doing as much damage, mm. you know, like, physically, you know, visual damage, uh, and Jose's shots were, but Frankie fucking pressed him the whole fucking match, was on him the whole match, Yeah, and they end up giving it to fucking Jose, and I'm like, how? How do you bitch up a whole fucking match and win? That's bullshit. A lot of it is is the ten point must system, which it, and most you know MMA pundits will say does not belong in there. It, it's a, a boxing based system, and it, it doesn't apply to mixed martial arts. And yeah. they refuse to to change the system. And no. this is a severe flaw in MMA judging. It is, and it 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 shows stuff like this where you have a better fighter, you know, that loses because of bad judging. You know, a bad, flawed system and flawed judges. Mm-hmm. I, to me, even though he took more sustainable damage visually, Frankie Edgar kept the pace of that match. Right. He chased Aldo all around that ring, fucking threw beautiful combos, like just mm-hmm. threw some vicious, just one, two, three combos, was always setting up, was always on the aggressive side, and Jose basically just played, like, slap away boxing and <laughs> yeah. shit like that, and it was it was crap. Yeah. I think it was bullshit. To me, it falls under that same fucking bullshit of um, uh, Rampage Jackson winning against the fucking uh, the Japanese guy. Mm-hmm. It's how do you fucking get your ass handed to you for fucking two out of three or all three rounds and then somehow come out the fucking victor. Like, yeah. it's bullshit. I, you know, I... It, it, bugged, it bugged me. And so now it's like Jose Aldo is all, like, set to take on McGregor and shit. Yeah. And... I hope McGregor just knocks the fuck out. Yeah, he'll be knocks like, his dick in the dirt, in the dirt hard. And like. of course, we had a kind, of, kind of a controversial match: the light heavyweight championship. Uh, Daniel Cormier um, was supposed to face John Bones Jones, but about a couple days before Bitch the fight, Jones, yeah. Bones Jones uh, law, uh, failed popped. a drug test, got yeah, popped. Yeah. 
and he's claiming that the fucking sample tainted is supplements. Tainted. Like, What's it tainted so, with coke? Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> I tainted it with cocaine. Yeah. I'm like, oh, sorry, my supplements are all like. Uh, I snorted all those supplements. I did all so. that supplements off that stripper's ass. <laughs> like, but with two you. days notice, no training camp whatsoever, and coming off of major surgery, yeah. Anderson the Spider Silva stepped in and gave a respectable performance. Okay, so this match is hard for me to talk about in the sense of like it was it was kind of a shitty match. Yeah. But it was a shitty match because Daniel uh, had trained for so long to fight Bones. Yeah. That's who he was fo- like he had trained his whole camp very was upset around yeah, about it. Was and, upset about and it. Called him so, out on it too. Yeah, it was like, it, fuck it, you, man. I trained my ass off to face you and yeah. you just do fuck up as usual. Yeah. Even in an interview they had where it was him, Dana, and fucking Jones and stuff like that, he's like, I'm excited for this fight to happen, but I know you're gonna fuck it up. I know you're gonna fucking like I mm-hmm. hope you don't, but I know you're going to. And yeah. he did. You know, and so th- this this match was hard because it was one guy had trained so long to fight another person, and then another guy hadn't trained because of a major... Like, Anderson Silva had his gallbladder removed, yeah. you know, and hadn't trained from it, you know, and, but stepped up. And it sucks because it's one of those things where it's like a guy who was the best fighter, you know, uh, some will say... It, you know, in history, as far as like pound for pound fighter, guaranteed was, Hall of know, Famer, guaranteed Hall of Famer, to come back and show a performance of like that he did, and mm. it wasn't like he wasn't a bad fighter. It was just this is what it looks like when a fighter hasn't trained and mm. stuff. Like mm. this is kind of one of those things that people get to see where it's like these guys have to train diligently day in day out to yeah. stay in these amazing fighting shape because three you know what is it like uh three minutes five minutes rounds and stuff like that 25 minutes that's a 25 minutes of fighting for a guy yeah. who just came off a of surgery who hasn't trained no. got the notice on like two days and stuff like when i wrestled six minutes like three rounds of two minutes six minutes is brutal when you're everything you've got Oh, yeah, so absolutely. 25 minutes for these guys is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Cormier took him down, did a lot of, you know, like ground stuff. They were booing and stuff because they, they wanted Anderson to win, you know. And people were, ex- were getting mad at the ref for not standing him up. And I'm like, okay, but here's the thing. You can't always just because one guy is on the mat, you know, like dominating on the mat – you can't just be like, okay, stand up, mm-hmm. you know, because he's a gold medal wrestler. Right. You're taking his skill set, his advantage away, and you're giving it to the person who is the stronger striker, you know? I understand standing him up when they're not doing anything, but he's always... In this, there was jockeying for position, for submission, for mm-hmm. different things like that, you know? And my friends were yelling. They're like, oh, fuck, this is not the match we want to see. Stand him up. And I'm like... No, shut the fuck up. Like, quit saying stand them up because you want to see a slug fest. This is. Yeah, this is not what fighting is about. Yeah. Like. And Anderson, he gave it the best. And in fact, like, in the last, like, uh, last uh, round, he started throwing some serious, co- uh, like, combos that caught mm-hmm. uh, Cormier. And it looked like if he had the energy, just had trained enough to get that energy to capitalize on it, he could have won. Yeah. Because. He had rocked him enough, but he just didn't have it. Yeah. And, you know, but they had a lot of respect for each other. Daniel Cormier was basically, you know, he won. He got the decision. And, I mean, Anderson got down on his knees and basically, you know, did the thing, like, thank you, praise like that. And, like, yeah. Cormier got on hands and knees, hugged, kissed, and said thank you to yeah. Anderson for doing this. I, I give him credit you for know? that. You know, I can tell you, it, it's both of these fights, actually, the Aldo fight and the Cormier fight, it's like, th- these are a case of, like, what should have been. Yeah. Because the Aldo fight should have been him and Con- Conor McGregor until Conor McGregor went batshit stupid and yeah. did all the dumb shit that he did. And then, it's, of course, this should have been Bones Jones and Cormier, and it should have been a, a great fight. Both of those should have been great fights. And the thing is, like, do you think that, you know, with proper training camp, do you think Anderson Silva would have walked out of there with the belt? If he hadn't had the gallbladder surgery, or if that had been further on down, he had had the camp to Mm -hmm. train for it, yes. I think 
he would have like if we even got seventy five percent of the Anderson Silva that we had had in the past mm-hmm. and stuff like that, I think he could have took him. Yeah, like his the small little series of punches that he put together in that later uh, round. Daniel Cormier had nothing for it. Like so I, I think him... he could have, in a striking game, took him and stuff. He just was gassed. He's I... older and he was gassed. I give Silva a lot of credit. He didn't get knocked out and he didn't get submitted, mm-hmm. and that really does mean something to take it to a, a decision for a guy who had no training and coming off a major surgery. I find wow. that impressive. He had a lot of heart. Yeah. And of course, this was the match that was kind of like, even though it wasn't the main event, a lot of people considered it to be the main event because of the star power involved. And of course, yeah. this is Brock Lesnar's return after five years yeah. to UFC. Uh, Brock Lesnar defeated Mark Hunt unanimous decision uh, in uh, three rounds. Yep. This was a disappointing fight for me. Mm-hmm. This was disappointing in certain ways, like uh, in certain. At half ways, you got the Brock at his peak, Mm -hmm. and in other ways, you got Brock when he fought Frank the very first time. Yeah. You got a, you know, a a kind of, he made some mistakes and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. He was so, so ready, so energized and stuff that, like, he gassed himself hard in that first round. Like, he was beat red. This has been a problem for Brock. And, yeah, that was a thing. He gassed himself too much thinking that he was going to do one of two things. Either knock Mark Hunt out, which... He was not going to do. Not going to do. Or throw him around like a rag doll, which he did not do. Yes, he did take him down, and he had some beautiful pickup slams on yeah. Mark and everything like that. But I think later into the second ma- uh, second round, he realized that Mark, with him being as gassed as he was, and Mark has such a good defensive game mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and stuff that. He had to. He knew he wasn't going to be able to strike with, uh, with Mark. Yeah. Because he got tagged by Mark, and I think there was that look of like, "Holy shit, this little Samoan guy can knock me out." Well, that and like Brock's jaw is not what it was. No. Um, After and, people like Cain yeah. Velasquez and all the rest of them, it's yeah, it, not. It, what it was. It was, it was a, a dangerous proposition. He could have easily gotten knocked yeah. out, but and I've seen Mark Hunt knock out people, you know, just as tough as Lesnar. So. Yeah. And that's. That's the thing. It was like this was an interesting match because Mark, uh, like they started off the match and they were very, they were dancing around, kind of like testing each other. Brock didn't immediately shoot in. He was kind of like trying to see where he could get his openings and mm-hmm. stuff. But once he started, he started getting you know really like aggressive and right. you know he just he gassed himself. Whereas like Mark is used to fighting in pride and them doing yeah. those grand prix. He had to fight. He's got stamina. Yeah, he's got stamina. Mark also has an amazing, like, ground defense. Mm-hmm. He's got some of the best striking. Like, mm-hmm. he's got, yeah, he doesn't have the ham hocks that Brock does, yeah. but he'll throw jawbreakers at you that will right. knock you out. But also, he's got, with his shorter reach, he has one advantage. When Brock would took him down... Brock was trying to like pound on him from on top and stuff and mm-hmm. he had Mark on his side and the thing is because his reach is so small and he has so much experience he was actually literally throwing shots from his side right. down and just drilling uh Brock in the face yeah every there was like people were like oh unanswered shots every time Brock was throwing like elbows down on Mark Mark would take the shots and as soon as he could boom Right yeah, to Brock's face, punches, like yeah. just these small, short, just enough to like really catch him. Mm-hmm. And even after it, you look at like how Frank Mir's face was, and then you look at Mark Hunt's face. Mark took the beating that Brock had and was like, "Okay, it was a close like, fight." I mean, every round was twenty nine, twenty seven. It was not. Uh, it was not a blowout by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. It was. Brock's superior wrestling came into play. The yeah. fact that he's a bigger, stronger guy, he yeah. was able to pick up and like impose his will in that way. But even then, it wasn't as dominating as we've seen. Yeah. And his striking, you know, definitely wasn't. And he was smart about it in the way that he didn't play let's throw ham hocks mm-hmm. at each other just over and over because Mark would have knocked him out. Yeah. I give it to Brock. He won this. But it just, this... It was kind of a disappointment because, you know, you wanted to see something. Well, everybody wanted to see Brock knock somebody out. And I wanted to see Mark knock Brock out. (laughs) I wanted to see it because I wanted to 
uh, prove to everybody because everybody thought Mark was just like, no, it ain't gonna do much. Like my cousin was like, oh, this fat Samoa is gonna get his ass kicked. And at like, the end, you've never seen Mark Hunt fight. Yeah, like. he had. He <laughs> didn't even know who Mark Hunt was. I had to explain to him. Come but on. He was like, okay, I'm. I'm sorry. I changed my yeah. mind. I, that guy's. You know, a lot of credit to him. And you know what? This was one of the few matches I saw. Mark had respect for Brock, and Brock had respect for Mark. And that means a lot, because Brock is not a guy who shows a lot of respect for his opponents sometimes. Well, this was a different Brock, because at the end of it, too, Brock wasn't all super cocky or anything like that. He took time to say thank you to the soldiers Mm -hmm. and, like, basically talk about, like, people we need to come together and, you know, be peaceful with each other and stuff like that. This was a very different Brock. Good to see he's grown up a little. Yeah, so, like, it was disappointing in certain aspects of it because I didn't want to see Brock get gassed that quick. I wanted to see him be able to do what he could do. He just... And you could even tell Brock was disappointed in himself in how quickly he got tired and everything like that. But I still think it was... You know, it was a decent match. Yeah. And, of course, the what a lot of people have said is the fight of the night. Oh, by God. By far. Um, yes. The women's Bantamweight title. Oh, my God. Misha Tate versus Amanda Nunez, who uh, Misha Tate lost her belt. Uh, let's see. Round one, what, three minutes, 16 seconds to yeah. a rear naked choke. Yeah. But this is the thing. The rear naked choke wasn't even the thing that was the beauty of this. Nunez had Tate's number as far as strikes. Yeah. Like... And she had her number when it came to grappling. That was the other thing. Misha Tate came in for these strong grapples and stuff, and Nunez basically, like, just slapped her off, was able to, like, throw her and keep her off and keep her stand-up. And, I mean, once it happened, you knew what happened. Misha went in, Nunez stuck her right in the face. I mean, like, right between the guard, just drilled her, and then proceeded to just home in on her face. Oh. By the time it was done, dude, Misha Tate's face was bloody. You, her nose might have been broken. I mean, she just... She had a spot she picked. It was Tate's face and just obliterated her. And she hit her like this combo that stumbled her and you saw Tate literally go in like a feet like not necessarily a fetal but a very much like I need to recoup from this right, shot right. and Nunez just pounced on her and she got her she took her in she got the rear naked choke it was amazing I mean she wholeheartedly with everything deserves that belt domination she yeah dominated her like the way you know, Tate dominated, you know, Holly Holmes and how Holly mm-hmm. Holmes dominated fucking Ronda Rousey yeah. and shit. Like, this was a, not a close match. This was a, somebody came in and wanted it more. This women's division's on fire, man. Yeah. I have to tell you. Yeah. It was, uh, it was really good. But overall, not a great show. It was a lot of matches that should have been one thing and we got yeah. another. And it was just... I don't know. It was, to me, it was not great and stuff. For me, one of the best fights was that Sage Northcutt fight, Mm -hmm. and that was a prelim. I have never seen a guy, the the guy looks like he's an Abercrombie and Fitch model, like a surfer boy model type guy. They call him the karate kid. He did, like, sport karate. Yeah. Man, he was, like, just his, like, ring awareness mm-hmm. and striking was so good and even when Enrique got him on three three arm bars we're talking like full extension arm bars I watched the first one this kid's arm bent like the other way it wasn't supposed to didn't tap in fact spun around got out of it and started drilling him with that arm yeah I've like, seen Sage North got fight before and he is an impressive fighter yes he was amazing. Like, he did... An, and I think Enrique thought he was going to win. Yeah. But Sage never backed down from him. Ba- yeah. Sage, like, took it to him, took the arm bars, got out of them beautifully, and just took it to him. And he deserved the win. I think he was kind of surprised, too, that he won, but he well, was since like... since we're in the fight sports sort of area, let's, we just finished Raw, or fast-forwarding through most of Raw. Yeah, fast-forwarding through Raw. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say. It was an okay show. Um, it was better than it's been yeah but it's is still there was great parts of it but yeah. it was not a great show um the only matches i really thought were you know all that memorable um titus o'neill and heath slater had a nice little match it was a glorified squash but titus, yeah. i like watch, watching titus um 
Uh, Sasha Banks and Dana Brooke had a really, really good match, actually. I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, Sasha, they're making her look quite dominant going into, uh, you know, possible match the matches that they're uh, trying to do Charlotte, with her and yeah. Charlotte. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm really hoping that she's the one that takes the belt off of Charlotte. If anybody in that division deserves it, I think it's Sasha because, I don't know, in ring and out of ring, I feel she's a better all-around competitor and Mike person than Charlotte. Oh, yeah, like, by far. She, as far as, well, Mike especially, like, as far as, as Mike work goes, like, she's got Charlotte over a barrel yeah. on that shit. Yeah. I think that, like, she's a legit superstar. Like, she has the potential to be a huge not only in the ring, but, like, media-wise, all that stuff, she really kind of has the mm-hmm. in factor. Yeah. So I think that they they can see that, too, and I think that because of that, she's going to do very well, and yeah. she'll likely be walking away with the belt, either at Battleground or SummerSlam. Oh, God, I hope. Um, probably what's going to happen, I assume that Battleground will be a fuck finish, and they'll, they'll give her the belt at SummerSlam because it means more. Plus, there's also taking into account the record mm-hmm. of, like, Nikki Bella... How yeah. long she held the title for? How long they're going to do? You know, with Charlotte, right. are they going to let her break Nikki's record? You know, because she's pretty close to it, from what I understand. Yeah, she's pretty close to it. Yeah. So they might do that. Um, um, the only other notable thing to well, there's two two other notable things. Quickly, uh, they did announce Vince announced who's going to be in charge of the shows, and of course, as we assumed it was going to be Shane's going to be in charge of SmackDown and Stephanie of Raw, and then they're both supposed to pick GMs. To yeah, they're both them. like the commissioners yeah. of the set They're bringing shows. back the title of commissioner, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, and and then, they want it to, it to be a very competitive thing. They want this at each other's throats. Yeah, Vince is very much about the being competitive thing. Yeah. The other thing that I didn't enjoy quite a bit from the show that was not really a match necessarily was uh, they built further to the New Day and... Uh, and the Wyatts thing by doing uh, the New Day, like the Wyatts challenged them to come to their compound. Yeah. And the New Day came out there and they did, they filmed this in a very like, uh, very much like they filmed the Wyatts promos where it's like kind of shaky camera and like interesting effects. It felt like music. a very like wrong turn type yeah, of Yeah, it was a very cinematic. Aspect. Yeah, yeah very. it was like very horror movie cinematic and actually it was really cool. Like, it, it was it really It meant good. something. Yeah. It felt like you made you want to watch this match happen. Like it, yeah. there was, you know, they teased like that, that uh, Xavier is kind of afraid of them. Yeah. And, you know, they, the, the Wyatt's kind of, I mean, there was, there was back and forth, but there was a lot of domination happening there, and the Wyatt's looked strong as hell. And, yeah, they did. And like, it, in it's this... making them scary again, and that's yeah. what they need to be. They need to be fucking scary. Yeah, that was the thing. Like, for a while there, you can't... They made this mistake where they're like, oh, we're going to do this passing of the torch where Bray needs to become the new, like, it's scary guy. So yeah. we're going to have, like, Undertaker or Kane and stuff. And right. I'm like, okay, but the problem is you can't do that because... There's no torch to pass off in the sense of, like, if Undertaker and Kane together, or just Undertaker, is in this match, Bray is automatically yeah, null and void. Because the Undertaker is just, it's, it, those it's guys are such man. big things. Yeah. yeah, it is the dead man. He has literally been that guy, that scary guy you, some people prayed they never had to fight right. for 25 years. Exactly. You know? And he is a big guy, and he has dominant striking capabilities. He's got the submission. He's got that like ability to just come back from anything. Bray, being a good wrestler that he is, has not shown those certain qualities that make people afraid to fight him. Right. You know. Let me say one thing that I will say about this that actually is a huge positive in the favor of the Wyatts is like this. The way this was filmed and the way that they did this, this actually made Braun Strowman intimidating. Oh, God. Like, he's big intimidating as far as physically, but he always kind of looks kind of silly because he's got that, like, uh, you know, Revenge of the Nerds animal thing going on. Yeah. Like, But in this lighting, and, like, they were out in mud and stuff. And, and he had, this, like, the shirt yeah, off. You got his the shirt off. Size, and like... they, there's one point where, like, him and Biggie had been fighting in this, like, mud hole, basically, and he comes up out of the water, and it looked like something out of a fucking bog creature movie. Yeah. He looked fucking legit one horrifying. Of the, one of the ones that I thought was really insane was, like, they, like, they took the car and smashed it into the truck, and then there was a lot of, like, smashing windows and yeah. stuff. But there was a seed where it was, like... Braun literally ran at, I think it might have been Kofi. Yeah. And Kofi, like, rolled out of the way just right. in time. But you saw Braun Strowman dive and smash full body into the windshield of this fucking car yeah. and destroy it. It was insane. Like, bare chested. 
And I mean, then he's all like covered in the mud and screaming and shit. They're throwing tires. Fucking um, Xavier was in the woods and fucking Bray chased him down with a pickaxe and stuck it into the tree yeah, right oh, next to his it, head and it shit. It was really like, cool. Like, I give him credit. This was a really cool kind of segment. Yeah. And I dug it. And it reminds me of like, you know, some of the stuff that even though it's very the stuff that TNA is doing right now with the Hardys is very goofy but it is also like this cinematic stuff that mm-hmm. is not just yeah. in ring you know stuff it's stuff that's like a little bit more high concept yeah and I like that they're taking a chance and doing something like that and the why it's it works well and like with the New Day being like the very kitty thing and like super positivity and all that yeah this was they were in regular these, clothes yeah putting up against these scary monsters is exactly what you need to do you need to yeah. put them up against these guys that are legit threats to the belts and that are legit like the exact opposite of what they are yeah because like they did an amazing job of not only making Bray look like disturbingly scary but you made Eric Rowan and Braun Strowman look like horrifying. Yeah, just, wow. They did these creepy things with the women in the white dresses, sundress type things, wearing creepy. the fucking masks. Oh, yeah. Like all the cars lighting up on the outside mm-hmm. and the fire. Like they did a lot of shit. It was really I mean, cool. this was scary because you really got to see, like, Big E is a big guy, but compared to these three dudes, the rest of them look tiny. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. they fought a good fight, but this was just, it was it had that scary moment like watching Bray beat the shit out of Xavier then carry his corpse over his body and then fucking like doing that low ground shot where you just see him drop him off like a sack of potatoes and Mm -hmm, shit like mm -hmm. that you were like I think they may have killed them it was definitely the best segment on the show like by far so it was very cool and I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to that match yeah but uh, yeah, the rest of the show was what it was. It's, it's there was another good thing. I liked. I, think, I liked the Gallows, Anderson, Enzo, Cass uh, thing. It was, it, was, it was a good match and with good talking, good yeah. build up. Good build up. I think this was they had played on the whole that like John Cena wasn't going to be there because mm-hmm. he was doing the host and the ESPYS and stuff. And then you know he's like, "Oh, see, he's not really there for you guys yeah. and shit." And then you know he ends up showing up. Of course, there was like. They did a good job of doing a fuck finish that worked out in Enzo and Cass's favor, but they still got jumped mm-hmm. type mm-hmm. shit, and then John comes out and saves them. But this this was a good pick as far as a tag team to put with John Cena and stuff. Yeah. It would make sense that they, these guys would work with oh, John absolutely, and absolutely. stuff, and they work well together. It's going to be a great match. Man, it's going to be a great watching, six, man. Yeah, watching Gallows and Cass collide with each other's is insane like Cass is on fire he is he's a beast of a guy Mm -hmm. you know Um, they had a stupid battle royal in the beginning that really annoyed the shit out of me because it was it was annoying but it meant something. It meant something. Which it was, was good. Yeah. They had, like, The Miz talk a bunch of shit, and, like, Baron Corbin was there with this stupid Andre the Giant Battle Royals thing. And Balding it, Corbin. Yeah, Balding Corbin. <laughs> uh, the only person they actually let come out to a thing, like, the, was, was uh, Apollo, Apollo Crews, Crews, yeah. Which made you want to believe that he was going to win and stuff like that. But the winner end up being, and I think this was probably the best decision they could have given it to, was Darren Young. Mm-hmm. Because they've been doing these vignettes for like over a month now uh, of this, the you know, make Darren Young great again thing with Bob Backlund, Backlund. where and, ba- and Backlund was there with yeah, him. Yeah, and so like actually building something and making it mean something yeah. is a positive. Yeah, you know, it was good to see them actually. And so, I like Darren Young; he's yeah. a, he's a talented guy. And so now he is the number one contender. So at Battleground, he's taking on the Miz. Yes, you know, please God, God, let him beat let the Miz. Win. Win. Yeah. Hate the Miz. Yeah. So, you know, overall, it was an okay show. It was better Raw than the last couple of Raws have been, for sure. Like, it the, held my interest a lot more the than the only, last few shows. Yeah, the only thing I think that really could have been done without, and I know you agreed with this one, too, <laughs> was this stupid Rollins report thing, oh, where yeah. it was like a chop video thing. Where They've he basically, done this so many times with different people, and yeah. it's just like such a lame fucking thing. Like, oh, it's the, I'm supposed to be interviewing, but you're using clips from an old interview that make it sound like Roman's blah, blah. Here's what pisses me off about this. Roman Reigns is gone right now because of a fucking wellness policy violation. That means in some way he violated the drug policy. You should not be getting segments on Raw where they're constantly talking about this motherfucker. But they are. That's but they the are, thing. and this really just infuriates me. You're you're basically rewarding him, even though you oh we suspended him. Yeah, but you're constantly keeping you his name on TV him for just short enough that he can still show up for his fucking title match. You know, at a pay per view, which is. 
bullshit. It's infuriating, and I just I I can't watch it without just getting infuriated. Yeah. So I I and I and I, and I called this. I knew they were going to do this, mm-hmm. and like I, I know you had hoped they would. I really did, but I knew they were going to. They're using it. As, as a part fun, of the story. As part of the story. Which I hate. And I'm like, oh my god. The like, only time this didn't bother me was it when, when uh, Jeff Hardy and CM Punk did it. That's the only time it didn't bother me because it made sense to the characters. Yeah. Because CM Punk is the straight edge guy and he's and the he anti-drug guy and shit. And he's the, his, his real life persona. And Jeff has had so many fucking drug issues and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they, they took that thing that wrestling can do very well is take a real life thing and make it a story. Mm-hmm. But they didn't do it right off the heels of a fucking suspension that Jeff was on. No. Yeah. They did it, you know, later on when, you know, shit was in the past. Like, they didn't reward Jeff for this. They made Jeff look like a piece of shit, basically. Yeah. You know, they they did not make it, you know, glamorous or whatever. And I think this is what they're glamorizing it, and that's what pisses me off about yeah. it. But I it just, whatever. Was, I hate Roman Reigns, yeah, so fuck it. It was, <laughs> it was what it was. You know, it's just... And then next week, we've got the last Raw before Tuesday, home, yeah. the, the draft pick. So well, actually, Raw is the draft. Are they doing yeah. the draft pick on Raw? Yeah, stuff? the draft okay, is so Raw. So then it yeah. will be, and there is a uh, championship match, a one-on-one championship match with um, Seth and uh, Dean. Oh no! Actually, you're right. It's on Tuesday. It's the 19th. Yeah, so yeah. it's on Tuesday. Yep. So, well, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, it it was okay. But there's your fight sports news of the yeah. week, as yeah. it were. Now we also uh, this has been a heavy Star Trek week. Uh, as far as news goes, mm-hmm. um, I'll get this. I'll actually, do this one first because it isn't related to the main Star Trek news. But uh, one of our listeners, a longtime listener of the show, Josh Deeds, sent me some links and uh, turned me on to a campaign that he's involved in called the We Want Wharf campaign. And what they're doing is they're um, Michael Dorn a few years ago had started floating the idea of doing a Wharf solo show, which I, I'm all for because I really like Wharf as a character and like I think he's a character that that is strong and can carry a show. Um, now. Uh, they took it to CBS, like he took it to CBS, and CBS passed on it for the in favor of the show that they're going to be doing. But they're but the the kind of grassroots thing has been happening with a lot of the fans and former cast members of the various shows still kind of pushing for CBS to take another look at it. You know, with the Star Trek universe kind of expanding with the new movies and the new show and everything. And so that's kind of been a thing that, that they've been doing. And um, if you want to check it out, it and uh, it's on Facebook of the We War, uh, the We Want Wharf campaign on Facebook. But they also have a website. It's WeWantWharf.com. Um, if you go there, you can see pictures of different folks from the uh, the Star Trek universe wearing the We Want Wharf t-shirts, which are hilarious yeah. and awesome. It's a hashtag We Want Wharf in the middle, and there's like ridges, eyebrows, and a beard, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. Uh, there's interviews on there. There's uh, links to different articles um, and like more information about what the premise of the show would be. And you can also get merch, which is really cool. And the merch actually goes to support the campaign. They have a, a limited edition canvas print of this really awesome uh, Wharf uh, artwork that was done with like him and the bat left. It looks very wicked. And the D- it looks like the DS9 outfit. Yeah, too. which looks awesome. And they have a t-shirt version of it, which I would love to have that t-shirt. I would sport it like a G. And they have hoodies and uh, and baseball tees and all that stuff. And you can get links to the Twitter and the Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's wewantwarf.com. So everybody check that out if you're interested in that sort of a thing. And, and they have actor interviews and videos and uh, news and everything on there. So all of your information there. And they also have a Facebook group. Uh, if you search on Facebook, We Want Wharf, you can find that too. For all the wharf files All the wharf files out there. But it's been a big week for Star Trek news um, because uh, one of the things that came out recently is there's been all this talk about uh, rights to the Star Trek universe. A lot and, of fan-made right. films, sh- TV, or web shows. And we talked about this before. Like we talked that. about Renegades. I talked about it pretty heavily because I watched it and I enjoyed it yeah. uh, very much. It was a fan-produced um series in, set in the Star Trek universe with a lot of really big names from the Star Trek universe being involved in it like yeah. um, of course Tim Russ is involved in it Tuvok of, of Voyager and um, uh, yeah Pavel Chekhov of course uh, Walter Koenig involved in it uh, Nichelle Nichols involved in it a lot of Star Trek alumnus involved in it and Robert Picardo and, and, and bigger named actors too like Sean Young and um, uh, Edward uh, fuck uh, from uh, Terminator Furlong. 2 yeah, Edward Furlong 
So a really, and it was really a solid film. Like I watched the the pilot film it was a two hour pilot film. It was a really solid, fun to watch, cool Star Trek concept. Mm-hmm. It was very gritty and dirty, and not your atypical Star Trek. Yeah, this is like what when you're not part of the Federation right. Trek. Like, and then of course the big thing came out a few months ago where Paramount sued the producers of Star Trek Axanar, which is this really cool concept film that they were doing that was crowdfunded. And Star Trek had, I mean, uh, Paramount had a problem with it because they thought that there was profit being made on it made out of it and they proved in court that this was not the case yeah. but uh, it's because it had a bigger budget than most of these yeah, things it had about over, two million uh, like two or three million dollar budget and it looked fucking gorgeous yeah and I've, I've been following it too and it looks it looked amazing well uh, Paramount has used their bullying and used their money to make it so that now uh, there is no Star Trek other than Paramount yeah so, no more fan made yeah, any of the fan made stuff if you use Star Trek they will literally come after you yep so, Renegades was going on, uh, the, you know, unfortunately, they, they had originally produced it as a pilot for CBS, and CBS passed on it, and they were just they were just doing it as a web series. Mm-hmm. And they had funded uh, quite a few episodes of it, and there's tons of Star Trek people involved in it. Terry oh, Farrell, yeah. who hasn't been in anything in a long time, who's kind of retired from acting, came out to be back in it. Robert Beltran, a lot of people. And uh, it was really, you know, gaining a lot of steam and momentum. And at first, Paramount was behind it. Mm-hmm. But since this has come down, unfortunately, because of this, Renegades has had to remove all Star Trek from the show. Yeah. And they're going forward as it just being an independent science fiction series. Yeah. Which means they're having to take all those races that they were using out, all the references to Star Trek. Which is so hard because there are so many yeah. central characters mm-hmm. that were Star Trek characters. And it's like, how do you bring them back? So they're going to do a lot of reshoots, and they're doing new alien species and new, uh, new you know, centralized core. But the the uh, basis of the series is basically still the same. It's just they're having to take the references of Star Trek and the Federation and all that stuff out. And mm-hmm. and I honestly, uh, they there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, fan support behind this. There's a lot of really talented people involved, and I think that you know even though this is a huge setback and obviously it is i think that they really are are committed to making this a true thing and because it's no longer star trek it has potential to be something that could get picked up by a network at some point yeah. like sci-fi channel could look at this and be like well it's not star trek we, we could can, touch it we you can know, touch it, yeah. you know? and there's a lot of people involved in this really awesome you know talented people that and could be playing reoccurring characters if a network exactly. picked it up so there's, there's potential i mean yeah it sucks for them, and I know this it does is, because these people love Star Trek. They fucking live it and breathe it. Yeah, and there was I, some other fan based you know? stuff uh, being done, like crowdsourced that had a lot of the cosplay, which was like older Trek, right? Style original stuff. Trek, yeah, the original Trek, and that's null and void now. Yeah, like that, really unfortunate. And this is really shitty because, like, this is something you figured was going to happen when Disney bought Star Wars, that they yeah, were and they haven't done that, and they haven't done that. Now they did basically are like. The expanded universe, you guys can still have it, that's cool, but as far as, like, us, that's Mm -hmm. not canon, or, you know, you can still do all your fan films, that's fine and stuff, but Paramount was like, I don't know, to me, I'm like, you... Star Trek's are, you know, pretty diehard fan yeah. base, and I feel like this is one of the biggest slaps on the face you I can ever do. I can see it from both sides of the coin. Yeah. Because intellectual property theft is a big issue. Mm-hmm. And if they're, if these guys were out there, like, trying to make money on the side and, like, this doing this shit for profit, yeah. then they absolutely legit have a case. Yeah, and that's true. But when it comes to this, you know, completely fan-funded, there is no profit being made out of it. The only people that are getting, you know, the actors are getting paid and stuff, but they, there's no, and they're not selling it for profit this is just fan produced stuff because they love the subject matter yeah it's it's a little harsh but i think that this is probably going to end up being a landmark thing you know when it comes to intellectual property from now on yeah and this is this is going to be a touch yeah this is going to be basically this right here will be the downfall of fan made stuff like you know now this gives them legal rights to go after now like fan fiction mm-hmm. stuff like now you won't be able to like write about certain things they can go after you for that if you're touching their property at all in any way shape or form yeah that's unfortunate fucked. it really is and that's shitty because like man star trek fans are some of the best as far as like you know they're hardcore they're, they're hardcore as hell. Yeah. and they've gone the distance with people and stuff like that i i mean and I don't know. It just 
this is one of those changing of the guards at Paramount, and this is really mm-hmm. like a very like wow. I I wouldn't have yeah. expected this. Now, I'm not you know? going to be you know because like, I'm not going to dog on Paramount because I honestly I do understand both sides of the coin. I understand but it, it just, too. For as a fan, it, it is kind of sucky. Yeah, it's very like it's a slippery slope. And yeah. the, they've started going down it, and you know you never know what could be next. Well, the biggest Star Trek news this week, with the movie coming out on the twenty second, the announcement was made earlier in the week that uh, the character of Akara Sulu, uh, who was originally played by George Takei in the original series and now played by John Cho, um, they're they're actually going to have him be a gay character in mm-hmm. the series, uh, which a lot of people were like really jazzed about because George Takei, of course, in real life is homosexual. And uh, but unfortunately, George Takai himself has actually come out and said that he did not want this to happen. Yeah. And it, and I understand both sides of the coin again on this one too. It's like uh, this George Takai made an argument that that we've made for characters ourselves on this show many times is yep. that uh, I would much rather you come up with a new character then, that ha- doesn't have a history that can be you know just out there and gay and not just change this character who has sixty years of history. Yeah. Behind it, and I and I understand that I do. I understand both sides of the coin. And he went, you know, he we talked to J.J. Abrams, he talked to the director Justin Lin, he talked to John Cho, yeah. he talked to Simon Pegg, he talked to all of them. You know, please don't do it. And they decided to go forward with it anyway. Yeah. And they really, I really do think they're doing it as a from a place of respect, and they think that it is something that will make the character have more of an identity and yeah. be something that's out there and they're doing it in respect but I understand his point of view and I understand their point of view and I think one of the things is like uh, that we've talked about before like with like uh, Alan Scott yeah and the new 52 stuff you were really upset with that and Mm -hmm. even I kind of was like okay well you kind of screw yourself on other characters yeah but it comes back to one of the things is this is a different timeline of Star Trek you've seen it because Kirk Mm -hmm. and Spock and all of them, they're all very different characters. They have a lot of fundamentally same things, but they're also fundamentally a little different, too. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, In when Alan Scott, when they came out and said that, like, uh, he was going to be gay and stuff like that, it was a very this is a very different uh, Alan Scott. It was, all of them are very different characters. Right. Uh, Jay Garrick got his powers from a god. Yeah. Alan Scott's Green Lantern powers come from Earth legitimately. Yeah. Like these are different characters. So in this alternate reality, it's okay. It's understandable. But yeah. yes, I understand. It's two. It's also you're taking a character and instead of creating a character that you feel is strong enough to stand on its own. Exactly. You're taking a character that already has so much history and you're like, I'm gonna change this super fundamental thing about them. And then be like, oh, well, you should be okay with it. And it's like, okay, but you're not doing it. You had an idea. You wanted this type of character. Yeah. And you're doing it this way. That's the thing. It's just, you know, I, I like, that is the only reason that it doesn't, like, completely annoy the shit out of me. Like, because, and it's the same thing with Alan Scott. Like, it pissed me off because Alan Scott was a character that meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And I felt like it was a cop out. You're trading yeah. on the name value of the character. To uh, you know, do make a showy thing. Yeah, and I would much rather you. It's just like changing the gender of a character or changing the the race of a character. Any of that stuff. It's like yeah. why don't you just fucking be creative enough yeah. to come up with a new character? Like the Iron Man thing that happened earlier in the week, where they talked about what the new the new Iron Man is actually going to be like a black teenage girl. Yeah, she's a black teenage girl. Okay. But that's different. It's like someone else is taking over the mantle. It's yeah. not like Tony Stark is suddenly uh, Tony with an I, black teenage girl. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, or Luke Cage is not all of a sudden a blonde white guy yeah. named Luke Cage. Like, it's a different character. Yeah. It's still Iron, you know, Iron Man, you know, mm-hmm. perf- related well, it's character like or whatever. The female Thor. Same thing, yeah. yeah. But with this, it's like, um, you know it's taking Sulu which is a character who's well established who has progeny in the universe you know who's gone on through it and the same thing with Alan Scott who had progeny in the universe and important heroes and things like that and you take that and you completely negate all that shit yeah. in order to just change one thing about them yeah. you know and then and I understand like I said I understand both sides of the yeah. thing I think it's like one of those things where it's like if you can play with it in a alternate timeline or an alternate universe that's fine you're you're you have a loophole right. there but when you do it in standard context and stuff right. like that, like taking JSA Alan Scott yeah. and being like, nope, like, he, oh, no, he's even gay, after uh, yeah. like 70 years of history, yeah. he's gay now. 
<laughs> I mean, Marvel did. Marvel played an interesting loophole when they did it with Bobby Drake, Iceman. Yeah. They brought uh, a version uh, of the original X Men, the original five, mm. from the past into the future yeah. when he was still very young, and because of the time period and what everything was going on, Bobby was able the the past Bobby was able to come out as being gay and yeah. stuff and a lot of people started looking towards the the now Bobby and they're like well wait are you and it's one of those things where it's like he might have been but because of how he grew up mm-hmm. that decision was and that's at least a creative way of doing things yeah like and, and the thing is like okay if it was the regular let's say that in the, the Alan Scott it was a regular universe and he said like you know what I'm an old guy at this point and I don't care anymore yeah. and I've been hiding this for so long and it's like I guess I had children and a lot of gay men have gone through this yeah. a lot of, uh, one that of the shows show, that I yeah, love so much the other show that I love so much on Netflix Grace and Frankie they dealt with this very much like uh, Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston were law partners for you know 40 years yeah. and came out as gay in their 70s you know and then they're you know, divorced their wives and stuff to get married and it's like this is a very real thing for an older generation that you could not be comfortable publicly being gay when you're you yeah. know a person that's you know in your 70s now in the time period where you were younger you really couldn't be out and comfortable yeah. like that especially if you're you know high profile person i watched a documentary on netflix uh, the other day about tap hunter who was like a, um, a teen heartthrob actor in the 60s uh and it talked a lot about like him and uh anthony perkins from psycho who was also gay but never came out uh, but you know, passed away of AIDS. But he had a wife and four children, and still claimed to be straight up until the day that he died. But of course, it all came out afterwards. Mm-hmm. And Rock Hudson and many of those other car- you know guys from that Dies, period, you yeah. just could not be gay in yeah. Hollywood at that time. You couldn't. Well, it's interesting too because apparently uh, Zachary Quinto really wasn't happy necessarily with mm-hmm. uh, Takai's reaction to it and stuff yeah. because he is also he's also gay, gay too, and stuff yeah. like that. And I'm like. I can understand him not being necessarily happy about it, but I think he also has to understand from George Takai's yeah. point of view and stuff. So I think George Takai just... loves this character, and he doesn't consider the character to be himself, and that's no. the thing. Like he he believes in the lineage of the character and what Gene's are, he he wants it to be what Gene's original vision of the character was, yeah. and I understand that very much too. True, that is a very strong argument for that. But then I I also with Star Trek alternate timelines is a very prevalent thing and this is not an unusual thing for me whatsoever. So like I said, I understand both sides. I don't think either side is right or wrong. To be honest, it's just it's it's just what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. But it was it was it was a really heavy Star Trek news week for that. It was it was very interesting. There was a lot of like controversial Star Trek stuff. This week was all Star Trek, UFC, and fucking Pokemon. (laughs) Poke a motherfucking mind. Talk about it. All motherfucking week. Everybody around me has got the fucking phone out looking for Pokemons in my basement, looking for Pokemons down the fucking street. You know how much I don't give a fuck about Pokemon Go? You know what? Pokemon Go fuck yourself. I don't care. You know what? Pokemon was something that was not part of my life ever. Like, it was something that was, by the time it came out, I was too old to give a shit about crap like that. For a generation that's slightly behind me, like your generation and a little younger, yeah. like you know, 30 to 25 generation, that is something that's very important I mean, yeah, to them, and I like respect that, me. I do, yeah, but I find it very annoying. <laughs> I find, like, motherfuckers, like, it's not as if people don't have their face in their fucking phone 24 hours a day already. Mm-hmm. This is just another fucking reason for people to have their face. And then there's been reports of, like, car accidents happening because of it and shit, and there's... stupid people doing dumbass-ended shit yeah. because of it. It's... It has produced some hilarious pictures, I'll give yeah. you that. Like, a Pokemon on a stripper's ass or whatever. Yeah. That's hilarious. A diglet coming out of a toilet. Yeah, and I, I have it. I just like yeah. to tease you guys. Like, I honestly don't give a shit. Yeah. Play whatever the fuck you want to. I play that fucking pair game like it's, you know, religion or I whatever. I was gonna say, yeah, you... But, like, fuck I don't it. know. I've like, watched you I scream at your fucking <laughs> yeah, desktop. Yeah. Hair whore! Yeah, and fucking just, <laughs> you know... Uh, futility and shit like that. I understand what the original idea for was. It was kind of something like along the lines of like a Wii. It was supposed yeah. to be more active, more getting people out there and it's, stuff. That's like that. another thing too. Like I feel like and that goes back to my old like problem with the Wii. Is like I felt like it was a fucking sham to get people to exercise, like mm-hmm. to trick people into exercising. Which like you know whatever like video games and exercising they don't need to coincide for me like I want to do one or for the other for you yes but other people like you know it's it, it plus by and large bit... the Wii mostly sucked because yeah. like most of the games were barely even games like yeah. but... I like a lot of the like 
like we bowling. The sports the stuff sports is stuff, fun. Yeah. It's like a party thing. It's not really like for hardcore gaming. It's yeah. a party system. Yeah. But this is the same thing. It's like go walk around the neighborhood and fucking find Pokemon, whatever. But pay so, attention to what the fuck you're doing. Yeah, Don't play it while you're thing. driving or I'll kill you. And that's the thing. Like <laughs> they've even come out and on the app and stuff and they're like, dude, be aware, be responsible. Like I was talking with people at work about it and stuff, and the guy's like, Yeah, me and my five year old son do it. We you know, think right. it's fun to do and stuff. He's like, But I have common sense. I'm not trying to find Pokemon while I'm driving. Yeah. Or, you know, he's like, There was almost a person hit this past weekend who tried to run across the freeway. To yeah, get to a get a fuck about Seriously, yeah. think about that, like, realistically. But, I don't care if you like it or not. Yeah. Think about the the lack of intelligence mm-hmm. and planning and forethought that went into that fucking action. If you're so concerned about getting a digital thing for a fucking game on your phone that you're literally willing to risk your life running across five lanes of fucking 70 mile an hour traffic you're an idiot yeah. you're a fucking idiot you probably deserve to get hit by a car and this is funny too because it's like there's a lot of like <laughs> stuff that have been going around uh, where it's like the older people like my age and stuff who watched Pokemon and played it on like the Game Boy when it first came out and stuff yeah we're all like old belligerent bastards, like all these fucking young kids that never played it on, you know, an original Game Boy. Like, get the fuck off our servers and shit like that. Yeah. Like, this is for us old people. Like, this came out. Blink One Eight Two has a number one hit again. Like, <laughs> it's two thousand one all over again. Like, it, fuck off. That's crazy. But it is. It's it's one of those things where it's like it came out with an, an idea of to like get people active, get people like community wise doing fun things, yeah. you know. But like, there are those idiots the people that are like i'm gonna fucking go after pokemon while i'm driving and shit like that you know or i'm gonna run across the street for this one and it's like dude it's just a pokemon it will come back and stuff i i tried to catch one before work and unfortunately i got fucked out of it but i was like oh well cool went to work anyways went back to that spot after work couldn't find it oh Oh, well i don't care because it's not real and it doesn't fucking matter that's why (laughs) <laughs> that, well, that, and it's like, if you're patient, this shit will generate again. You know, that's the thing. Like, the whole game is not like a one and done and you never ever yeah. fucking get it again. It's, it's like, just a game, guys. It's just a game, but there are these fucking morons that are so die hard fucking like achievement junkies yeah, or like, uh, I must have uh, this. You know, those fucking guys that paid hundreds of dollars for a fucking mint Charizard or fucking Yu-Gi-Oh cards or fucking shit you like know, that. And I'm like, morons. I'm like, come the fuck on, guys. It was meant to be something fun and you guys are taking it to that level of extremeness that it just doesn't need to. It's, it's just, yeah. Uh, so it's like... I've said my piece, yeah. I, and I will continue to mock you all oh, that's vociferously. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, you call know, you hipsters, and I don't well, care. It was fun, because, like, <laughs> me in the basement, babe, Vicky, we went out the other night, and we were like, she had just got it on her phone. She had to, like, do a bunch of stuff to get it. I can't believe like, her rickety-ass phone will even yeah. run the fucking thing. <laughs> and sketchy. <laughs> but, like, where she was at the time, there wasn't a lot of stuff, and I was like, hey, I know some pokey stops. Do you want to, like, go there? And it was actually really fun, because it was a nice night out. We sat there in her car, and we got to listen to uh, the one radio station that we both yeah. had really not listened to, and it played a bunch of songs, like older songs that yeah. our age liked. And I was like, you know, this is actually really fun. We're just, like, sitting here listening to the radio. Yeah. People don't do that shit anymore. No. You know, it's being true. acting like kids chasing Pokemon and stuff. We weren't running across the street or being stupid, yeah. you know. If you treat it, the, it was, this is like any of this shit. If you treat it the right way, there's no, there's no, nothing wrong with yeah. it. It just... I, well, I wait I'm sick of it time. because I'm sick of looking at it on my feed constantly yeah. oh, and that, motherfuckers talking yeah. about Pokemon. Hey, guess what? I don't care yeah. and I never will. <laughs> I think you're going to see a whole new level of stupidity <sighs> with it when the winter time hits because I, I, I know some some jackass is going to freeze to death trying mm-hmm. to chase down a fucking Charizard. And I'm going to laugh. And I am too. I'm going to be like, you're a fucking moron, dude. <laughs> but like, it's to me it's kind of like a throwback, like going to the drive-in. Yeah. You know, like you're... You get to go fun, go walk around and stuff. I've seen kids riding their bikes and shit. I've seen way more people, you know, out about walking. I've seen like uh, people walking their kids on their yeah. And you know what? And if stuff. it gets people out of the fucking house, then you know, more power to it yeah. and shit. But it ain't for me, but more but power yeah, to it. But I've seen some sketchy shit too. Like one of the things was some guy. I think it might have been over in the UK. There was a fuck up on the where they put like the gyms and the pokey stops. And instead of, like, this Pokemon gym being put at where it was supposed to go, they fucked up on the, like, uh, longitude, the latitude GPS thing, GPS shit, yeah. thing, and it was his house. <laughs> they made his house a fucking Pokey gym, and oh God. he said, like, he's 
fucking livid because motherfuckers are stalking his house. Like, <laughs> just <laughs> fucking people in his backyard and all kinds oh, of shit. I, I like, swear, I'm glad this did not happen to me because I'd be in jail right yeah. now. I'd be out <laughs> pounding hipsters in the face. Motherfucker! Get the fuck away from my house or I'll kill, kill all of you. Yeah, I'll kill all you son of a bitches. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, we've, you've got some news from the news of the week uh, to yeah, get through, and then we'll do Kickstarters uh, and wrap it up. So, Dave knows that, man. Dave's trying to remember what news it is. He opens the million throng of tabs on his phone to find the news of the week. There really wasn't a whole hell of a lot of news. Um,. There, like there was different news in like comics and stuff mm-hmm. as far as like uh, they're doing another they're doing a second solo Thor uh, this will be the original Thor mm-hmm. uh, but he's being called Odin son now uh, because of that whole secret wars thing uh, the ultimate Thor's hammer is now in our world mm-hmm. and he's going after that hammer to see maybe he might be worthy with it and this right. is interesting because this Thor has a very like buzzed cut hair the metal arm the beard and stuff and, and he reminds me more of like Eric Masterson Thor yeah he's a very mm-hmm. kind of more that way um They've teased the return of Richard Ryder, mm-hmm. the original Nova, the original Nova yeah. and stuff. I'm super happy because he was always my favorite Nova. Right. Uh, in San Diego Comic Con news, there was like they showcased the um, what the is raft, it? the raft box pack, set, box set. Wow, this is a hell of a box set. This is this is Abomination, Enchantress, Dread Knight, Purple Man, uh, the Sand Colored Sandman, yes. and unfortunately a Spider Man. But yeah, know. who gives a shit about yeah, that? that. This is one of the best Comic-Con boxes I've seen in a long yeah, time. Yeah, I want the Dread Knight and the Enchantress so fucking bad I can taste it. Yeah, like, they look I, I really want that Sandman, too. Yeah, that Sandman looks good. Then they had the 3.75 box set, which was the Collector... Um, Lockjaw, Lockjaw, Howard the Duck, uh, Moon Boy, uh, and the, some accessorities. The stuff. dog, the, the cosmonaut dog, yeah. and a couple little accessories. Yeah. Fuck all that shit. Lockjaw for the win. He's like, just give I me a fucking shit. Lockjaw. I will be, I will be literally scouring eBay, eBay. for like uh, factory reject yeah. Lockjaw because <laughs> I don't fucking yeah. care about the rest of that shit. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. I'd love to have a Howard the Duck and a Moon Boy because they're fun. No. I need that lockjaw. Oh, yeah, I the fucking lock love lockjaw. The lockjaw is the. the uh, I one need thing. that. I needs it. I needs it hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we had talked about like how Wentworth Miller's contract right. was very for much the, uh, DC for the DC universe for the DC open shows. Right. Well, apparently now um, John Barman signed a very similar contract, and we will be seeing Malcolm Merlin on Flash and Legends of Tomorrow oh, and man. stuff. <laughs> this is their really. I think this is a great idea because they're incorporating these strong villains across the boards, which is you're really reinforcing this whole shared universe mm-hmm, thing, mm-hmm. and it looks amazing. Now, uh, back to comic book real quick because this is one that I oh yeah I was geeking so fucking hard for this. Uh, recently, they did a crossover where it was Batman and Ninja Turtles, mm-hmm. and it actually did really well. I would people, read that. A lot of people, I would too. It looked really well. Batman came to New York City. Mm-hmm. Well. In keeping with that, DC is now doing a six-issue crossover of He-Man and Thundercats. Oh my god! Yes. Oh my god! My '80s like wet dream is fucking here. As far as like super like comic book shit, uh, Mumra will be searching for the basis of the thing is Mumra is searching for a weapon powerful enough to counter the Sword of Omens. Mm-hmm. In searching the different dimensions, he finds the Sword of Power on Eternia and goes after it. So we will oh, be yeah. seeing. You know the mutants I teaming up with fucking yeah Skeletor. Oh, it comes out in October of all months. Happy birthday to yeah, us! Yeah, happy fucking birthday to me because <laughs> I'm gonna be watching like reading the fucking shit out of this. Um, there's been all kinds of speculation again with like this whole Flashpoint stuff. What's mm-hmm. going on? What an interesting article that I read though was how this could actually be the perfect time and perfect way especially with like Jeff Johns coming on and being in charge of things Mm -hmm. of bringing back characters that were really liked that got killed off mainly like Deadshot from the Arrow show Mm -hmm. Amanda Waller um, Deathstroke Deathstroke well he's still alive but yeah different Mm -hmm. things like that different characters that were like "Eh, no no can't touch them or they have to go away and stuff Mm -hmm. now being brought back Uh, another one too was the possibility of like bringing uh Black Canary back, but mm. not as Black Canary, because in the storyline, Black Siren from Earth 2 
is still she's a meta she's a meta and she's around Mm -hmm. so it could be it could be interesting things and she looked awesome having the canary cry her canary cry is the one from the comics yeah and she was a badass fighter i would love to see that version of her come back like that version i honestly don't care like i just if they if they were bringing back a black canary not necessarily full time but if they were going to have one in the universe that's what i would want I just yeah. I don't care about Katie Cassidy's. <laughs> I know you don't know, like. I really like, severely like, just dislike her. Shit. Like, yeah, I like her as an actress. She's fine, but her fighting is completely unconvincing. And yeah. her Black Canary was just to me like an also run lame ass secondary because they fucked up and yeah. let Sarah do it first, and it was so much better. Yeah, that's that's the other problem. It was really really hard. Um, mainly that's kind of really it. it well, I want to throw in a little teaser note that I got some pre-release uh, uh, PDFs of the new Legacy Rising books, and I got to read one today uh, that Victor Dandridge is writing called Night and Day. And uh, I'm not gonna, I, I can't review it because it, the book hasn't been released yet, and like I'm not authorized to do a full <laughs> review or anything like that. But I will tell you that I had a lot of fun reading this book, and I'm really looking forward to reviewing it. And hopefully, um, we can. Actually, when the time comes, we can both get to read it and then actually talk about it on the show. Um, I got to talk to Victor a little bit about it today. and Victor's a class act, and it's always a treat to read anything that he writes. Oh, yeah. He does very unique storylines oh, yeah. and stuff Absolutely. like that. And always... this, is a, this is kind of a departure book for him. This is yeah. not his normal subject matter, and it's it's interesting to see him take a, a take on something else. So. Yeah. Very excited about it. All the Legacy Rising books, of course, are coming at Wizard World on the uh, weekend of the 30th, 31st. I will not be here for that, but... Uh, possibly, we've, yeah. We found out today uh, that that it is possible that Dave is going to actually get to go. Yep. So we, we're not for sure, but Which, the opportunity. We're going to go there. harass Michael Watson for some of these prints. Like I saw this Casey <laughs> Jones, and all oh, that fucking Yosagi Ojimbo will be mine, motherfucker. <laughs> like fucking two of my favorite Ninja Turtles characters. You better fucking believe I'm getting in prints. Yes. So then, then I'm going to go harass Victor, Michael. Dirk, all those motherfuckers. Every time I get in Michigan, Dirk is here, I swear. If I can go. <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to see if I can make this happen. Me and the stuff. captain. Make it Me happen. and the captain make it happen. I'm going to slap my balls on Dirk's fucking table. <laughs> as hard as, as you can. As hard as I can. <laughs> now, uh, it's, of course, time for the weekly segment of Kickstarters of the Week. Yep. And uh, the first one I'll talk about this week is Classic Pulp, um, run by Josh Warner and Travis McIntyre. Of course, you guys know them from Source Point Press. One of the uh, one of my favorite comic independent comic companies. Uh, this is actually a really cool concept. What they're doing is they're taking classic pulp books um, that are you know f- uh, from many many years ago that are not like uh, under copyright law anymore, and they're uh, Josh is painstakingly going through and doing a kind of digital retouch on all of them to make them look as good as they did the day that they came out, and they're collecting them into a uh, into the graphic novels. This is an awesome idea. I'm 100% behind this. I love classic pulp characters. If you guys follow my customs, you know that I do a lot of these characters because I don't want these characters from the 20s and 30s to be forgotten because they are the basis of our comic history. This is the wow. stuff, this is the reason we have comics is because of shit like this. Those these dynamite are, characters, yeah. runs they did for a while were and really th- good These are too. pulp characters yep. and this is the pulp horror stuff and you know the that sort of thing that, that really is just kind of disappearing from the landscape. And the fact that SourcePoint is taking the time to do this is just really cool. They're doing detective stories, they're doing horror stories, and and uh, oh, monster just, stories, and yeah. it looks just really amazing. And this, and the the scans that they've got up on this, uh, it just really looks beautiful. And they're doing an an, an a, a amazing job. Like I can't even imagine the amount of work that Josh has put into this, having to go in and retouch all of this stuff. And they're also doing these amazing prints with their own artists, oh, and they're doing Jack, Jack of Spades. Spades stuff in there, which I love. And it's a really, really cool Kickstarter. Now, it's a very low goal. Um, the goal is $1,000, I believe. Yeah, $1,000 goal. There's 26 days to go, and they're already at 686 So they are well on their way to an extremely successful Kickstarter. Yeah. And, of course, I, I'll most likely be taking part in it myself. And um, I really recommend that you guys go ahead and, and uh, go in and check that out. Because it is really something to... Uh, to keep our comic history alive, uh, you know, keep 
keep that the comic history from the 20s and 30s alive and, and uh, pay respect to the things that have come before. Yeah, because a lot of those old pulp like comics and stuff were not made on paper that it's, it survived well. Like a lot of those things like deteriorate. My uncle gave me some old school like comics that like I've basically had to like shun off to like a no dust smoking area type yeah. of shit that like just to so keep they, them yeah just to keep them from falling <laughs> apart you know so. Uh, Josh Dahl's Kickstarter for uh, Rapid City is still going on. Uh, I pledged to that one myself. And of course, he's funding Rapid, Ze- uh, Rapid City Zero number five, page by page basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's doing very well, and hopefully, uh, before it ends up, that we'll be able to actually get the entire book financed. So please check that one out. Rapid City Below Zero on Kickstarter. Um, I also have a couple that we mentioned in the last episode, but I want to make sure that we get a little update on them. The Metamora Kickstarter from Blue Frontier. The uh, Cthulhu punk sort of um, space Lovecrafty story, which looks really amazing. They are 96% funded, and they have 21 days to go, so awesome. Congratulations, you're almost there. You're obviously going to obliterate the uh, yeah. the goal on that one. Uh, uh, Jason Ford's Regret Number 1 has already obliterated its goal. With 23 days to go, it's 150% funded, so congratulations to Jason uh, that's kind of a um, uh, one part shadow run, one part commandy, one part doom sort of mutants and masterminds kind of story. A lot of fun. Um, Dungeons After Dark, the adult fantasy pinup coloring book, has 29 days to go, and they're currently at 39 percent funding uh, with 19. Uh, Which means 74. all you pervy ass nerds want to fucking be covering <laughs> yes, some fucking spank bank fucking. If you guys want to hear more about this one, of course, stuff. check it out. Dungeons After Dark on Kickstarter, but check out last week's episode where we talked more heavily about it and. Uh, it's, so it's a very interesting, interesting one. Yeah. Then, of course, there's the Guerrilla Comics Phase 1 uh, Kickstarter. Now, this is a very big Kickstarter. They're uh, they're basically trying to launch an entire comic universe. Yeah. Very similar to what Legacy Rising is doing, uh, but they are not. They, they chose to not do it through crowdfunding, but Guerrilla Comics is doing it through crowdfunding. They have an entire slate of heroes and slate of books that they're trying to do. Uh, heroes like Corvid, Bengali, and Phantom Hawk. Uh, they're only 13% funded. They're at 1750 right now, and there's 12 days to go, so... Um, if check it out, if you're interested, definitely you know, throw definitely some, throw some money their way. They've got a long road to hoe with 12 days left, unfortunately. Long road to hoe? Yeah, it's long road of hoes. No, you know, like hoeing. It's a farming <laughs> term. It's a thing people say it. Are they writing the hoe train? I, I grew up in a very southern household. <laughs> Just any excuse to bring up the Godfather and the hoe train, really, man. Come on. But uh, JR is going to be launching the Kickstarter for uh, Light Earth number three here in I think a week or so, and yeah. so everybody can take a look at that. I know Actually, I've been getting inundated with like launch stuff for it. Yes, I received my rewards for David Brown's The Magician this week. I got my comic and my business card and sticker and all that stuff and I love the comics it's absolutely wonderful it's a very um, it reminds me of like watching a 1970s Charles Bronson like revenge flick in comic form beautiful black and white art from DNS uh, David you know Charles Bronson's a sexy man he man. is a sexy he's man a he's sexy a sexy man. bitch <laughs> Charles Bronson oh. is a sex symbol he's <laughs> <laughs> a sex symbol of the 70s if you're into this kind of you know that 70s uh, kind of revenge stuff and, and into the mafia and the you know the it's a very crime, cool book. Crime stuff. Cop, yeah. I would PI totally stuff. recommend it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, the Kickstarter course is over because I got rewards kind of very, from it. Like, but... Same and Twitch kind of thing too. Like... Yeah, I think you would. I don't. Did you get to read it or did you look? Through no, it? I haven't. I looked. I through think you probably enjoyed it. Like actually, it, it was, really it was, it was a lot of fun. And I talked to David about it, and I posted yeah. a little bit about it. And I, I love David's work. Of course, he did Obscure, which I'm a huge, huge fan of. So. Yeah. Congratulations on that, and I was really happy to get my rewards on that one. And I also got my rewards uh, a week or two ago, uh, well, partial rewards from Salvagers, Bob Sally's amazing book um, that I love very much. And I'm uh, still waiting on um, the actual number one of the comic, but I did get the PDF version and got to read it, yeah, Bob, and I loved it. Hurry up, it. man. Well, yeah, Kickstarter takes time. I know, I'm just fucking... <laughs> Where's my money, man? Where's my money? No. Uh, Where's my comic, man? Of course, uh, we mentioned it last week, but I want to quickly go through all the, the live appearances that we're going to be doing. No, 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 wait, wait. we got to bring up Eric. Oh, yeah, uh, we want to bring up... Um, uh, is it That's this right, weekend? I remembered. Is it this coming weekend? Is it? Is it this weekend or next okay, weekend? Okay, uh, I'll actually... I'll look it up real quick on my phone. But, yeah, Eric Palicki is doing a signing at the uh, Polaris Parkway Barnes & Noble. Uh, I believe it's this coming weekend, but I am pulling up my Facebook right now to find out. Yes. He's going to be doing a uh, signing for Fake Empire, the awesome... Tooth Fairy book that we uh, reviewed on the show, and of course we were both huge. It's huge awesome! Fans so of, you guys get your ass down there and check it out. That book is definitely worth it. Not only is he doing a signing there, but he's also doing one in, in Barnes and Noble in Toledo too. Ooh, um, let me see. 
I've got his... The Toledo signing is July 22nd, and the Columbus signing is yep. July 16th. Yep. So it'll be this uh, Saturday? Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, this Saturday, yep. I believe. Uh, let's see, the 16th. Let's double check because I don't want to give the wrong information. The 16th, yeah, Saturday. Saturday, yep. And the 22nd is also a Saturday. So if you could make it out, um, it's at 7 p.m. Saturday. Uh, it's 15, uh, sorry, 1560 Polaris Parkway in Columbus. I'm definitely going to try to make it out for that. Yeah, if you guys wanted, like, hands-on issues, definitely yeah. go check it out. Definitely, again, worth it. And Book this is a big deal. You know, not a lot of comic writers get to do signings at, at big bookstores like Barnes & Noble. That's yeah, a really cool thing. So, I mean, so we're really jazzed to come out and show some support, motherfuckers. We're going to go out and class down the joint <laughs> by showing up. <laughs> if not, I'm going to, like, get a boombox again. I'm going to just show up to your house, play how many people want to kick some ass. <laughs> so I'm going to be like... <laughs> Jay and Silent Bob put a boot in asses and shit. <laughs> but I also want to mention um, that we're uh, all of our appearances that are coming up here. Um, we're going to be on the um, yeah, not a July 23rd. We're going to be at Packard Comics in Hilliard, Ohio for not at Comic-Con. And they've released a guest list. Uh, of course, we're on it, but <laughs> for the Artist right, Alley. There's going to be artists, there's going to be creators, podcasters, and uh, cookies as well. They're, the, they're having the superhero bakers coming back that they had before. Oh. So uh, Jamie Snell is going to be there, Travis Perkins, J.D. Larrabee, Patrick Bumgarner, of course, the Basement Fodder Podcast, and Silver Linings Confections. If you wear a cape or a costume, you get 10% off of your purchase. Free swag bags with graphic novels to the first 100 people at Nevada Comic Con. And this is the coolest thing, one of the coolest things. Free screen printing on a T-shirt if you bring in your own shirt, or you can buy one of their ready-made ones. But they're going to be doing Star Wars themed pack rat shirts. So if you bring in a blank T-shirt, they'll print screen print on it for free. And they're also doing build your own lightsabers. I want a swag bag and to build my own lightsaber. <laughs> How do I do that? Well, we'll probably we'll probably get a swag bag. We usually do. Yeah, okay. We usually do. But um, I'll make out with Jamie if I have. To. He's a pretty. <laughs> he, he man. He is a pretty man. A pretty man. <laughs> and of course, we're all, uh, that that Sunday, the day after, because <laughs> yeah. boy, we're just stacking this shit right on top of each other. If we can, we'll shove multiple in a weekend. And we'll do it. <laughs> we're going to be in Fairborn uh, at the I believe it's the Holiday Inn. Yep. Uh, at the not at uh, the Ohio Toy and Comic Show, mm-hmm. which normally is our birthday week. Yeah. Uh, but this year it's been moved up to July, so we're which I think is a really strong good yes, thing. Yes, actually, yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. And you're to get yeah. a lot of people in for that. And you know what? There's a lot more like foot items because it's summer for me yes. to be able to buy for Sarah, you know, <laughs> to torture her. Foot related I've items. already started planning a shopping list for this. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Sarah, I'm so sorry. He's, he started this. Like, I'm going to put together a beautiful bag of both <laughs> refined and yet creepy as fuck shit. <laughs> Like, it's going to be so great. We're going to do some foot photography. It'll be great. I want to get one of those, like, <laughs> things that you put on your feet that separate your toes so you can paint them, but I want to, like, shave the things that go between your toes to look like dicks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, whoop. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> I want to make it so Aaron doesn't know whether to laugh or hit me. So this might be our final. <laughs> <laughs> this is our third one in a row. We've been at every single yep. one from the beginning, and hopefully we'll be at the rest of them as long right. as Dave doesn't piss everybody off. We but, talk about <laughs> Kenny's going to laugh. Of course, it's run by our, our wonderful friends at Roma Collectibles and Mary Mercenary Cosplay. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of awesome folks there. I'm going to bring um, him a blue ribbon. <laughs> it's going to be a great show. We're going to have a lot of a lot of fun. I've, I've heard rumors of panels, and I've also heard rumors that our good buddy Matt Metzger is also going to be there. Pogues to all of you, host, co-host uh, with Ben Chapman of Not Another Origin Story, he'll my be, favorite podcast. He'll be doing a, a, a <laughs> thing about how to color in the lines and um, how to bitch about movies. He's going to be doing. A, he's going to be hosting a panel called uh, "Not Quite as Awesome as Basement Fodder," <laughs> <laughs> where he laments. God damn it! Buy my pictures. I'm decent. <laughs> he laments not being on the talk files yet, right? <laughs> because he refuses to actually. Or book the show. or being made into a comic book character. <laughs> he was so butthurt about that. Beautiful, that. beautiful. beautiful. But hey, there's going to be all kinds of should, awesome I think people he should there. Be made into a demonic imp that we that we hunt. We should down. tell Michael this. We should get on. Okay, this. Michael. Michael Watson, if you're listening to this right now, needs to be a demonic imp, a demonic imp, imp, imp who, who's him. constantly bitching about things and like drawing on people's shit. Oh god, it's a license <laughs> to print money. <laughs> <laughs> 
But we're going to have, abs- obviously, a lot of fun at that one. And, yeah. and, they, and it's possible that the original Basement Babe might get to join us on that one, too. Yeah. And the Packer Head Show, possibly, possibly too. So yeah. If we're lucky. Yeah, so that'll we, be a lot yeah. of fun. Um, still have a super secret one I can't announce yet. That's going to be the Thursday of the that week uh, before Wizard World. And then the weekend at Wizard World, uh, you know, of course, you might get to actually go to that. But I will be in Taylortown, Michigan for the Taylortown Big Show. That's the uh, at the Taylortown Trade Center. Too many people to even list yeah. <laughs> that are going to be there. But um, if you guys have been to a Taylortown show before, they have, you know, it's in the indoor flea market. And there's these two big giant rooms on either side. Well, not only are we going to be filling up one of the giant rooms, we're going to be filling up both of the giant rooms. So I'm going to be there. JD, uh, Jared Blanton's going to be there. Stephanie Menard's going to be there. Source Point Press is going to be there. Arvel Jones. So many people I can't even, you know, go to yourcomiccon.com to find out more information about that one. I'm super jazzed. I'm actually going to be joined for the first time by, uh, uh, since Dave can't make it to that one, our good friend Ariel, who is uh, in talks to become our anime consultant <laughs> for the show because, uh, for the Todd Files at least, because I don't, read anime nor care about it (laughs) so she might be my anime go-to lady (laughs) when it comes to that because some anime you go to she's more the cutesy stuff oh yeah which you can't stand and i can't stand even harder yeah so she's she's into that stuff yes for shame shame. i'm gonna look at her down like (laughs) no we love your booby (laughs) anime chick Uh, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) i love boobies i just don't like anime i feel vomit rising (laughs) in my mouth now (laughs) she's gonna be joining me for the first time Uh, she's got a lot of con of experience she used to do a lot of anime cons back in the day she worked for one of the con companies back in the day so She'll probably be better at this shit than I am. Dirty. <laughs> Dirty shame. I'm just going to go stalk Amy Jo Johnson at Wizard World. <laughs> like, yeah, Michael, that's great that we're going to be in your comic, but I really I'm just coming there for, be friends I'm with coming Amy there for, for just multiple reasons. I have to <laughs> hang out with Mike, get shit, fucking talk to Vicar, Victor. Vicar. S- Vicar. The Vicar. The and British the priest. I have to slap my nuts on uh, Dirk's, Dirk's, table. Dirk's table, and then I have to go get arrested for trying to touch Amy Jo Johnson in the wrong way. You should way. go say hi to Adam Baldwin. I think he's... No, no, he's going to be at Cincinnati Comic Expo. Yeah. I was going to say that one I'm actually looking forward to, because I I, I'm not like specifically a Firefly fan, but I am a fan of Adam Baldwin in general. Yeah. The non-Baldwin Baldwin. Yeah, the non-Baldwin uh, Baldwin. <laughs> But, hey, this is this is big for me because if I can get her to sign my morpher, that's it. I'm done. Yeah, you're done. Like all the Rangers that you know, all the original Rangers have signed it. It'd be pretty damn wicked. I'll tell you yes. what. Yes, then I'm gonna rub it in my friend Mike's face. <laughs> That's why we do anything to rub it in someone else's face, isn't it? Uh, just because he's always like, oh, look at this old ranger stuff that I've got. And I'd be like, I've met them all. Suck dick, you balding bastard. <laughs> Your new name is Balding Corbin. <laughs> you were too busy. You sing the bald song to yeah. him? <laughs> bald, 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 You are bald, that's what it's called. <laughs> like, see, you were too busy getting fat and losing your hair, and I got to meet Power Ranger people, and you just have some toys from the 90s. So Hang out and dick. interview them. Our buddy uh, from the Ninja Starship, Ninja Starship podcast, uh, Jimmy McKnight, he actually got to interview Amy Jo and mediate her stuff at the uh, Philadelphia Con, I think it was. Oh, yeah, when she did the, yeah. Yeah, her experience yeah, stuff. Yeah, so that was really awesome. He's a lucky man. Yeah, for he's that a lucky, one, lucky so man. Like he's that, very yeah. thankful. Trust me. I bet, dude. <laughs> but uh, that's the, we're getting close to shilling time. Is it? Is it? Yep, is it shilling yep, time? Yep, is it three thirty-seven a.m.? Yep, dance monkey. <laughs> well, of course. I've got to go on my Pokemon hunt, so hurry up. <laughs> I'm going to go the, walk around the neighborhood at 4 in the morning, morning trying to find Pokemon. Looking for Jigglypuffs and shit. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> trying to find Magikarp. <laughs> it's bullshit. Stupid well, fish. The, the time of the show where I show like a 3 o'clock in the morning pitch man trying to sell a slap chop. That's right. If you like what you heard this week on the Basement Fodder Podcast, you can, of course, always find our family of shows at our website, thebasementofdoom.wordpress.com, and on our network home of digitalnerdage.com. You can download all of our shows on Stitcher, iTunes, uh, YouTube, Spreaker.com, all those places. And, of course, you can find us on Facebook under Basement Fodder Podcast, The Basement of Doom. Todd of Basement Fodder, Dave of Basement Fodder, the original Basement Babe, and of course my main job, Titan Trap Custom, and of course on Twitter, at Basement Fodder, at Titan Trap Customs, and of course the same things on Instagram, not Tumblr, Tumblr is only for Don't go to Tumblr! (laughs) And uh, of course uh, you can always check out uh, my former uh, co-host at the moment, unfortunately because of all the computer programs, the eventual Jedi himself, Clint Thiel, on the Geek Dig Podcast every week, geekdigpod.com. And, of course, you can find uh, that on all those various social media places and uh, and downloading places as well. Woo. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Basement Fodder. Yeah. And, and until next time, the basement door is closed. <laughs>
Later, bitches.